Thank you for being part of the Bible class. If you got your Bible, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll get there in just uh, a few minutes as we go through the class itself. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and at least have it open, have it marked, you can do that. But I appreciate you being here. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, we're grateful to you for this morning and the opportunity to be here. Uh, we're thankful that it is the first day of the week and we gather together to remember our Lord. Uh, and that even though he died on the cross, it was on the first day of the week that you resurrected him. And Father, it's in that resurrection that we have hope and everything attached to that. And we're grateful for that. Uh, we thank you also for the opportunity on this first day of the week to encourage each other and to build each other up. And we pray for your blessing on all of our Bible classes and on the worship here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are in our next to last class as we're going through this Pillars of a Godly Marriage. Uh, just those uh, things that will make our marriages stronger. Uh, but we're also trying to make sure that those who, uh, of us who are not married, or maybe one day we'll have plans to do that, that these are pillars that impact your relationship from friendship uh, to brothers and sisters in Christ uh, and anything else that, um, that we may be a part of. Just as a reminder for everybody that is married or plan to do so that uh, today's the last day for the marriage seminar registration. So if you haven't done that, that's the workshop is in a couple of weeks. So all you got to do is go to one of the banners outside in the foyer in the lobby and just scan the QR code and you can register. Uh, and today's the last day for that. So the pillar we're going to look at this morning is going to be conflict and uh, really how you handle conflict. So we're calling it conflict resolution. Uh, you live with somebody long enough, you work with somebody long enough, you go to church with somebody long enough, you're going to have conflict. Uh, it just happens. Uh, that's just where we are. Sometimes it's just going to be over the course of time. Sometimes it's going to be for other reasons. So let's look at a working definition. Um, and I'll pick and choose some spots for us to discuss some things, but a working definition of conflict. Uh, conflict happens when one person is at odds with another person over what they think, over what they want, over what they do. Uh, so it's pretty simple. I know maybe there's other, other ways with trying to keep things fairly simple, uh, but conflict happens when it's one person uh, with uh, another person over, over what, what they want to do. Yes, go ahead. Just one thing before we get started. I, I think some of the brothers, uh, we may need to have a class on poetry. <laughs> I understand that uh, there were some uses of the term horse and uh, goat this week. And uh, so if, if y'all want a, a course of poetry to kind of help you with the conflict of your marriage, let me know. <laughs> so this gives us a good working definition of, of just how we're approaching it. Obviously, conflict, we look at our, in our mind, we think conflict's just a knockdown, drag out fight. Uh, it could be anything from just a simple uh, disagreement uh, to exactly that, a yelling and screaming match, if you will. But just to look at a couple of reasons why conflict exists, sometimes it's just basic differences between the individuals. Uh, so I put as an example, it could just be habits. Uh, for one person, a habit is just that. It's a habit. It's no big deal. Uh, but you live long enough with another individual, and they look at your habit, or you look at their habit, and it's, it's Mount Everest. You know, why, why, is it this, you know, why is it such a big deal? Uh, one person looks at it, another person again, well, it's because it is a big deal. And so you have just basic differences. Uh, that includes our personality, that includes all kinds of other things. Sometimes you have a previous relationship, uh, positive or negative, a previous relationship, friendship. This includes a church. If we move from one church to another uh, and you had a bad experience, we are all full of experiences and it's going to be extremely difficult to not take an experience and overlay that. So sometimes we have uh, those previous relationships. Stress is a, it can be a source of conflict. It may be both of you, maybe one of you, uh, but it could be several reasons why uh, what's causing the stress. Different role expectations. Uh, well, I thought you were going to stay at home and take care of the children. Well, I thought you were going to go back to work. Uh, there are different roles and different expectations that we assume of the other. Uh, well, I thought you were going to take care of the project. Well, we were in the meeting, I thought, you were, I thought the boss said you were handling that. Uh, there are different roles, different expectations with that. The bottom one is the ugly one, selfishness. Me, myself, and I. James just puts it 
very bluntly and very clearly. Um, where do wars come from? Where do quarrels come from? Where do all these things come from? Is it not your passions? Is it not your desires? Is it not, and he goes through a list, and sometimes conflict arises because one of us is operating from that point of view. Uh, there are a couple of other reasons as well, uh, but these are just some possible reasons that exist for conflict, and maybe that gives you an insight to your current conflict with somebody, again, whether it's your spouse, a friend, a uh, brother, sister in Christ, whatever that may be. The conflict exists. So there are five levels. Uh, you start at, the, we're going from top to bottom, as you see in the bullet points. Uh, the top would be where there's the least amount, and the bottom, as you can tell, I'm using the word war. Um, that kind of is self-explanatory. So five levels of conflict. Again, this is verbal. Uh, this would be body language, anything that you could assume with that. Problems to solve mean that both individuals know the problem that exists. The reason why we may have conflict is because X problem exists, whatever that is. And that's level one. Uh, and they're both committed to trying to solve the problem, whatever that may be. Big, little, doesn't matter. Uh, but they notice and they're keeping the problem in the center. What happens is as you start escalating into the conflict, the problem is usually forgotten. And it becomes off-center and something else be becomes in the center. So there you have disagreements. And disagreements usually happen when it's this. I don't know if I can trust you to look out for me. And if I don't know that you will look out for me, the only person that I know that will look out for me is me. Make sense? So you may have a natural disagreement because of a perception, because of what happens, uh, because of how you see things, how you're hearing things, that's part of it. It's natural. This move shifts when you go into the disagreement and you, become, you go into self-protection. You want me to take it off? Oh, is it rubbing it? You think that's it? Maybe? We'll see. Okay. Uh, so we move into, into self-protection. Uh, so I've got to take care of myself because uh, I'm not sure you're going to do that. I'm not sure you're going to look out for me. Um, and when that happens, we now move into the third level, which is contest. It's a power struggle. It's a me versus you. It's a me versus them. Uh, I don't, again, I've already determined that you're not going to look out for me. I've already determined that you're not going to put this up front. And so it now becomes a contest. It becomes a power struggle. Somebody's got to win. And now I'm moving. I'm moving away. Again, the problem's lost now. Not even interested in that. I'm interested in something else. And then the, la the next to the last one, fight or flight. Uh, you know, either we're going to fight about this or I'm going to run away from this. I'll give a couple of uh, other um, op options from that. And then the last thing is just war. We're just going to erupt in war. War words, war of actions. And you just, it just, you know, starts dissolving. You see the progression downward spiral of how things are and if you look if you just think of your most recent conflict with somebody and you just start overlaying some of these things you'll see the principles there you started out with whatever the problem was whatever the perceived issue was and then by the time you got into the conflict itself and it started manifesting you forgot what it was about you forgot that you were arguing about this you forgot you were arguing about that you're not hearing me Self-protection language. Why is it that you never listen? And then when we start raising our voice, I am now in power struggle mode. And you're going to hear me. You're going to listen to me. Even if I have to yell and scream to get your attention. And then we're going to start do it. We're going to start fighting because who here likes being yelled at? Don't yell at me. Don't write. <laughs> You're gonna write. Oh, you like it just so you can hear. All right. <laughs> well, I have to talk with Miss Fran about that one. Say that. Um, so, I wonder if it's this. Uh, we'll take this off for just a minute. I'll keep talking while I do this. So, we get into this contest level, and it just starts dissolving. And it starts degrading down, if you'll notice that. And then, ultimately, we're now in war. And when it comes to war, as we notice with other places, um, can you hear me if I don't use this? Am I loud enough? Am I loud enough? Yeah. Yeah, okay. We can't, we can't hear the recording. I oh, can't hear the recording, but okay. um, uh, if, if Once we 
get in the war, then there's only one thing to do. It's to win that war. We know this just from a secular point of view, is that once we have that war, and once we get into that, we're going to do it. Well, how many of us want to be at war with the people we love? How many of us want to be at war with the people that we're supposed to be going to heaven with? And yet, how many times do we have war? Uh, so these things, um, these are five levels. And if you overlay it, you'll just notice this within your most recent conflict. So when that happens, we got some options. We got three options. Now there's probably more, but just for the sake of time, I'm only given three. When the conflict arises, you can escape. How many of you know of somebody that when there's a conflict, they just absolutely shut down? They just shut down. They won't talk. Uh, they won't listen. They won't, they won't do it. They just escape. I've I just got to get out of here. I've just got to escape. Uh, you know, let's just stick the head in the sand. It'll blow over, and when it does, I'll emerge, and, and we'll be fine. Uh, so we'll just escape. I won't answer the call. I won't answer the email. I won't answer the text message. The way I describe it, it's like going into a black hole. Something's going in. Nothing's ever coming back out. Uh, so some people escape. Uh, some of us just go right into attack mode. Don't yell at me. Don't scream at me. Don't use that language with me. Why are you? And so, you know, so forth and so on. And then, and this is my first assumption with everybody here, since we're all followers of God, then we want to do it God's way. Blessed are the peacemakers. You want to be a peacemaker? Do I want to be something else? Got to handle conflict. It's not going to go away. So what, what do I do? Now the other aspect of this that I'm assuming for us this morning is I'm assuming that we're all Christians, so we're, we're all going to, as individuals, allow the truth and everything in it to guide us. It's going to influence our heart, it's going to influence our mind, it's going to influence our words, it's going to influence our actions. I'm going to allow this Paul tells me in Colossians 3 to let the Word of God dwell within me richly. Something's got to take up my heart and my mind, and something's got to influence me. So I'm assuming that everybody here, for the purpose of this class, this is what we're most interested in. And this is what we're most interested in allowing to guide us and to dictate to us to a certain extent. The other thing I'm assuming when it comes to conflict resolution is that two both people are actually interested in the resolution. It takes two to reconcile. It takes two to want to solve it. And right now, there are some of you that are probably in a conflict with somebody that that individual is just not interested. And there's very little what we can do with those who are not interested. Uh, a Christian should never not be interested in resolving something. If Jesus, right out of the gate in the Sermon on the Mount, teaches us about peacemaking. Uh, not just in terms of a B attitude, but how to do it, um, then I think conflict resolution and all of that is something that Jesus is very interested in. So it takes two. So if you're somebody that's not interested right now in making peace, there's a whole lot more going on than just simply this class. There's a whole lot more going on with the heart and the soul and the mind that is in a very, very unhealthy place. We should all be interested and being peacemakers. So, what kind of attitudes should we have? I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians. And we're going to look at attitudes and we're going to look at actions. And I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians 5. And then we'll, we'll back up to Ephesians 2 as well. Uh, but just to look at something, some principles, if you will, uh, with these attitudes. Um, while you're turning there, anybody got any questions, comments, observations? I know we're kind of speeding through this, but I want to maximize our time. Anybody want to add anything, take away anything? All right, good. Where are you? Same, same page. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 5, if, if I could have somebody read verse 1 for me, please. Ephesians 5 and verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God, beloved children. Okay. So our attitude, our attitude, and it's going you know, to kind of go back and forth between attitude and actions. According to Paul, who is our primary person that we are to model our entire life after. God. Imitate God. And of course, you're going to tie in Christ because of what he's going to say in verse 2. Uh, but the command is to imitate God. 
So the question that we would have here when it comes to conflict resolution is, how do we imitate God, how do we imitate God when it comes to conflict? So somebody describe for me, what kind of conflict is humanity in when it comes to God? Okay, it could be a power struggle. Having their own way. Okay. All right, so even Jesus' famous words that the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak but a flesh and spirit. Anybody else? Just that, there is a God. Just that there is a God, which means that there is another individual in this. Uh, sin puts us at enmity. James will use that word enmity with God. So uh, the power struggle, the flesh, uh, having their own way, the other fact that you've got a God who has a personality of holiness and purity, conflict exists between an unsaved individual and God because of sin in whatever ways that it has been manifested. So, tell me about how God remedied the conflict. What does God do? Okay. So he brings in, and I, I, we're going to see that word. It's not patience. This is actually, long-suffering is the better word. Um, so patience isn't this immediate thing. It's this, it's a long suffering because this is going to take a lot of time. Okay, so he has an attitude of long suffering. Yes. Okay, he meets us where we are. Okay, I'm going to come back to that because you're, you're as close as to the kind of the way that I would put it. Anything else that we learn with God and how he started solving the conflict or bringing about a resolution, the conflict with humanity? takes the initiative. So both of you have the same thing. When it comes to the gospel, God makes the first move. Now we call it meeting us where we're at. He takes the initiative. But I want you to think about this. In a lot of cases, one of the reasons why conflict is elongated, not just that it happens, but why it's elongated, is that somebody somewhere is not willing to take the first move. Not willing to take the initiative. So what usually, when it, there's a conflict between us and another individual, our spouse, co-worker, somebody we go to church with, what are some things that usually stand in the way of us making the first move? Even admitting that there is a conflict. Even admitting that there is a conflict. So a person who wants to, to escape, the way that I'm going to handle a conflict is to escape. I'm just going to pretend that it doesn't even exist. So you've got to admit it, Okay. Ah, but Doris, what if so-and-so is 95% responsible, though? Okay, I once heard somebody say, when it comes to responsibility, because in a lot of the ways, it's the other person's fault, and they need to accept responsibility, even if they're 95% responsible. I heard somebody once say, though, that I am 100% responsible for my 5%. Now, I, I understand, I'm not assigning percentages, so don't go home and start assigning percentages. <laughs> don't start doing that. Love keeps no record of wrongs, and it doesn't keep records of percentages either. But in a lot of times, one of the reasons why I won't take the initiative or meet somewhere where they're at, they need to come to terms with their own. And how many times, even if it was just mine, even if it was just my 1%, do I need to take 100% responsibility? And what's amazing about this to what Stan and, and Sarah alluded to and said, how responsible is God for sin? How responsible is God for the power struggle that exists between a man and God or a woman and God? How much, what percentage do we assign to all of that? This is the principle of conflict resolution, that one of the ways that we can imitate God is to make the first move. There are a couple of other reasons that I have in mind. What else, what else stands in the way? What are some possible things that stand in the way of me taking the initiative? Yes, yes. And that usually alludes to what? What is God communicating when He uses... Okay. 
Okay, so that stiff neck is just like when we wake up and there's a crick in our neck and it just can't hardly move it, which is a great word picture. But behind it, to Doris, and I'll get to you in just a second, behind to your point, what's the reason? It could be just good old-fashioned stubbornness. It could be me digging my heels in the sand and I'm right and you're wrong. It could be numerous things that, for the stiff neck. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. They are three of the hardest words in the English language. What else? What else comes to mind, Brittany? Okay. It could be very much so. Great point. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and, and uh, we'll get to the humility. So the opposite of that is pride, which is a contributing factor to a stiff neck. And, and part of it is, is that it's not that you're not right. You very well could be right, but I once heard somebody say this, that you can be right, but in our, our, our um, commitment in making sure the other person knows we're right, it is very possible we could argue them right out the door. And again, that's not what we're wanting. There's a better way to get there, even if you're right. Uh, and how many times have we argued people right out the door, maintaining how right we are? Whether I mean, again, and it's not that you're not wrong. I mean, and that's the hard thing to go with. Somebody was raising their hand, Keith, and then Bob. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you're talking about a marriage, a, a marriage that is holy, a marriage that it's an opportunity to sh for God to be sh uh, shine, you know, through. Um, and again, it's, you know, so all of us are, so I don't need to worry about being right. No, there's a, it's, what we're doing is saying there's a better way. I can pound how right I am into someone else, but I can't be surprised over time that they become hardened. And of course, it's going to impact them as well. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sure. And we'll get to some of this. A, a big part of it is, is one, it's, it's conflict is not a peacemaking. And trying to just hold it in is not what Jesus did at all. Uh, Jesus finally, after three and a half years, had a brief conflict with Judas. What you got to do, you got to go do quickly. I need you to make a decision. You know, he puts Judas on the spot. He does with Peter a couple of times. He does with the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Uh, he doesn't hold it in. But he also doesn't, the next time I see this person, the next time I see Michelle, I'm just going to jump right into it. That's not it either. So we're going to look at some of this and how to do it. But the first thing is, is regardless, God makes the first move. One of the things that we have to acknowledge in making the first move is that the other person may not be, be um, able to receive it for whatever their reason is. It takes two. And if another person is not ready, or if another person is not willing, there's very little that we can do. God makes the first move for humanity. It's called the gospel. And how many, how many Christians exist? 
out of 8 billion plus, how many exist? 6 billion are not Christians. He still made the first move. He still gave the message. He still, sin is this, you did this, I love you. It's positive and negative. But he's got it, even God knows this. And this is something, Bill, you and I have talked about before. Uh, and it's exhibited. He puts the tree in the garden. Love's got to have the opportunity to be accepted or rejected. If you love me, you'll keep my commandment. You'll stay with the tree. But I've got to put this other one there. Love is a risk. Love is a risk. And in this case, the risk may be I make the first move and I don't get the outcome that I'm expecting. And that's hard. That's hard. Yes, go ahead. It is, and so we have to be humble enough to make the first move. It's not just the humility to solve it, or am I humble enough to make the first move? But you hurt me. You said some terrible things to me. This is like, what forg does forgiveness sweep it under the rug? Does humility just pretend it doesn't happen? And the answer is no, not in any of that. Uh, but again, this is all the other pillars. We're assuming, we're making some assumptions that if we're talking about a husband and wife, both of us have made the commitment individually to walk with God. I, I'm making some assumptions here. So if there's an individual that hadn't made that, this is going to be hard because they're operating by a different standard. But if two people have made the agreement to walk with God, as we, we talked about way back in the very beginning, submission should, it will be hard, but it's not impossible if I've made the commitment to follow God. Because my commitment to follow God even trumps my commitment to follow you. And I'm allow I can't imitate God if I'm not following God. can't imitate God if I haven't truly, in my own heart and in my own mind, accepted His way of doing things. And His way of doing things, the tip of the spear is the gospel. You want to solve some conflict? Can I swallow my own pride and make the, make the first move? Despite how they talked to me. Despite how they treated me. Despite what they did to me. It's not that your wounds don't matter. Somebody's got to make the first move or you're going to keep on being in conflict. Which one will we want? Some, somebody's got to decide. Somebody's got to, to do this. And I bring up Ephesians 5 and verse 2. And walk in love... As Christ loved us, and then notice immediately what the Spirit attaches to this. And gave Himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's not just that He made the first move. You think that's hard? If I think that's hard, what's coming is even harder. Who's willing to sacrifice? Who's willing to sacrifice being right? I have the right to be right. I have the right to be heard. I have the right to be listened to. I have the right to feel the way I feel. And all of that is true. And then if we are to walk as He walked, who's ready to sacrifice like He sacrificed? And again, it's a risk. So Beth and then Bob. <laughs> it was kind of like we yep. both submitted at the same time and then we got conversation going. Yep. So it's, it's a technique if you're both stubborn. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. And, and I know we may chuckle, but that's, that's a great way to create a bridge 
that the conflict may have not destroyed, but put some potholes in. That let's, let's find something that brings us to the table. So if it's literally a pie, a piece of cake, if it's whatever, then that is one way to be able to do that. And I like how you call it. It's an apology pie. This is, this is my way. Because it is difficult to what Mr. Orris was talking about. I am sorry. And I am sorry is sacrificial language. I was wrong. Sacrificial language. Again, it's a risk. Because your sacrifice name may not be reciprocated. It's a risk. Go ahead. It does. It does. Um, this is just that the, the conflict is there. And it's, again, all of this is not to pretend issues don't exist. This isn't to pretend that a problem doesn't exist. And we'll look at some real, uh, some real life biblical examples here in just a minute. But these are two attitudes. And there's a, it's not exhaustive because of the sake of time. But these are two attitudes that do, if we're willing to take them, and we're, we're willing to imitate God, they will transform any and all relationships that we find ourselves in. But you've got to take the risk. I, I keep emphasizing that because you may not get what you're thinking you're supposed to get on the other side. And the reason? It's because you're married to a human being. You go to church with a human being. You work with a human being. You have children. You're raising human beings. And all of that, all of them, including me, have free will. Sometimes people don't want to do it. Sometimes they don't want to make it. it. Takes two. Judas left, never came back. Peter left and did come back. It takes two. But whatever the person does or does not do, does not justify in my mind and my heart why I shouldn't do what he calls me. Well, so-and-so isn't doing it. You know this if you have children. Well, so-and-so isn't doing it. I understand that. But we're not talking about so-and-so. Well, such-and-such, I understand that, and I hear you. But we're not talking about such-and-such. We're talking about me. Talking about you from an individual perspective. So, did you know that the Bible is full of people who are in conflict? Both Testaments. And sometimes the conflict was resolved, and sometimes it wasn't resolved. And the greatest conflict that exists is between humanity and God. God made the first move, God made the ultimate sacrifice, and God did it all out of love. And the majority of people in human history have not responded the way that He desires for them to respond. And that's okay. He understands that. Doesn't mean He loves them any less. Doesn't mean His desire has changed just means he's acknowledging for right now a reality that's there. One of the very first conflicts that exists that's recorded post the garden is Abram. 
or Abraham, we'll just call him Abraham, his nephew Lot. And then several of you have already mentioned humility. And you know, I know you mentioned it, Sarah, you mentioned it. And sometimes it looks like, well, that's just not humanly possible because we look at Jesus and, well, Jesus could do everything perfectly. And he did. Uh, I, I need an actual flesh and blood human being that, that probably failed a few times. And Abraham failed a few times. Um, just very quickly in Genesis 13, what's the problem that exists? Anybody remember off the top of your head? I need a short, shorthand. I need to keep it as short as possible. Okay, and who was at who was at odds? When Abraham and Lot is actually their people that work with them, that it was the people that work with them. And how is the conflict resolved? Go ahead, uh, you finish it. Isn't that amazing? He has every right because he's older. He has every right because God has chosen him. And he has every right because it's his nephew, not his son. And instead, he goes to him and he says, I don't want this. I'm paraphrasing. I don't want this. You don't want this. I'm willing to, I'm willing to sacrifice my right of being the oldest, being handpicked by God. And I don't even have to give you the option, but I'm going to give you the option. I'm willing to sacrifice all of that. And I know you'll probably pick the best. I'm willing to take what's left. Conflict is resolved. Philippians 4, if you want to turn over there fairly quickly, just as something that's, that I'm going to read the first couple of verses here. We forget that these letters aren't just dealing with church situations. Paul very rarely mentions names when he's writing letters. But when he does, that should, catch our, that should capture our attention. So this is what he's going to say starting in verse 1. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm. Thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eurodia. Now he starts talking. What's, what's going on in the Philippian church? He's, he's finally, after three chapters, going to tell us. I entreat Eurodia. And I entreat Syntyche. What does the word entreat mean? Urge, appeal, I beg of you. I'm begging to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion. So he's now not talking to Eurody and Syntyche. He's asking somebody else. Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Herodian Syntyche in Philippians 4, 5, Paul will say that I want your reasonableness. It's not, I want the entire church. He is going to speak of that. But these two women, you hear your names mentioned from a public standpoint, what are you thinking? In other words, conflict is making you unreasonable. I need the two of you to be reasonable. And if you look at what happens when conflict and it starts, you know, downward spiral, one, if not both of us, start becoming unreasonable. And if you really want to make somebody unreasonable, tell them they're unreasonable. And it just goes even further. But we really become unreasonable because we're blinded by anger, we're blinded by something else, whatever that is. And his, his begging is, I'm begging you, I want you to agree in the Lord, and one of the pathways is that somebody somewhere along the way has got to be a reasonable individual. Somebody's got to be reasonable. Somebody's got to stop and say, even if it's to themselves, we're not accomplishing anything. Philippians 4.3, you want some conflict resolution? He brings in a third party. I entreat Eurodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. But I ask you, true companion, to help them. I ask you to help them. If you need marriage counseling, go get it. If you need Christian marriage counseling, go get it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with reaching out and asking a third party to help you. The gospel is full of a third party. You know who the third party is? 
Who's the third party in the gospel? Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man, the man. You know this. If you need a third party, you can talk to our elders, you can talk to me, you can talk to Charlie. You need more professional help, we'll recommend individuals. You need a third party, go get one. There is nothing, nothing shameful about asking for help in any sense of the word, in any part of our life. I do want to mention this as well because when we're, when we're dissolving things, we forget we're on the same team. Paul is very quick to notice in verse, um, uh, verse 3 uh, to help these women who have labored side by side. We forget we're on the same team. We forget that we got the common goal. We forget that we join together. We forget whatever that is. And this is, we need somebody to remind us you are on the same team. Any of us who follow sports, at inevitably a head coach at some point in time in the season, he'll speak vaguely, but if you learn the coach speak, he has spoken about we had to get on the same page. We had to get on the same team. We had to do whatever. I had to remind them. Uh, a lot of the time, I forget we're on the same team. I forget that we got the common goal. I forget, and you forget, it just happens. And somebody, reasonableness will shine through. But Philippians 4.3 is a great principle on that. If you want a formula, there's something that you want to have. I know we kind of think in our neck of the woods in these terms, so I put it this way. You need to choose the right time when it comes to conflict resolution. You know, the worst time to do it is when you're both walking out the door going to work. <coughs> You know, we need to talk about this 12 hours later. You know what that's going to do to the individual walking out the door? What it's going to do the rest of their day? What's it going to do to your day? It's going gonna, it's gonna to create all of this because your mind is just not going to be there. Now, I mentioned this from a, a couple weeks ago when it came to communication. This is why it's vital that you as a, as a husband and wife co-workers, whatever, if you need to schedule a time and you need a designated time, go ahead and do that. But the worst time to do it is when you're getting the kids ready and you're trying to get backpacks packed and lunches packed and say, hey, by the way, we're having this problem, we need to do this tonight. On top of whatever you got to do for the next eight to ten hours at work. And by the time you get to each other, I bet you're in the best of moods and you're ready to listen to whatever you got to say. So if you need to actually schedule time, schedule time. If you need to, and that time, by the way, there is no phone. There is no TV. There is no to-do list. There is, let's hurry this up because we got to do something else. None of that exists. You need to choose the right time. You need to respect the disagreement. That individual you're talking to does have another perception. They do have another viewpoint. That individual does have a say-so in the option. There's two of you. There's not one who dominates. It's two. Respect, the respect that. There is that disagreement. That's there. And there needs to be validating language. You know, so we talk about listening, listening well. Sometimes the question is, you know, I'm going to repeat, Tom and I are talking. Tom, let me, let me stop you. I'm hearing you say this. Is that correct? What did I just give him the opportunity to do? Explain. If I did get it wrong, if I'm not hearing right, I give him an opportunity to explain to me what's going on. Um, you need to identify the problem. Because after all, the problem, as we go down through that dissolving of that conflict resolution, that, we, that slide... Well, you're the problem. Neither one of you are the problem. The problem is neutral. Keep the problem the problem. Don't make each other the problem. Identify that. And if you need to identify that over an, over an apology pie, fantastic. If that needs to be identified over a, another meal, whatever works for you to identify that, that's fantastic. My, Anne Marie's here. Don't you bring home a donut? She'll keep, me, she'll keep me from talking because I'll be eating the donut. <laughs> I, and I have a bad habit of talking. I mean, that's what I do for a living, so I have to work extremely hard at that. But identify the problem and then keep the problem the center. 
Because inevitably a void is filled and if you move the problem out of the center, one of you becomes the problem and then it's just, you just lose it. Um, you need to express your feelings. Again, two of them become one, they were naked and unashamed. If the basis of our relationship, yes, is love, but it is also truth, I should be able to express how I feel. I should be able to express. You know what? That, that did hurt. That was a disappointment. You know? I'm sorry. I do feel bad what I said to you. You know, I, I really hate where we are right now. You're going to express your feelings one way or the other. It's a lot better to express it that way than in anger and chaos. Identify the different options in solving the problem. There's two of you. Not every option is my option. I don't know everything anyway, so why do I think that my option is the best option? Let's talk about it. And you know what? Maybe we'll try it out and it doesn't work, and that's okay. We'll try something else. So when you do that, review the chosen option. Can you review the chosen option? Again, all of this is the basis of communication. And if we're constantly in technology, if we're constantly just letting a day go by without all of this that's needed to be done, and all of this, by the way, this is based on the fact that you have good communication already. The only time, to, and it's a really sad state, and you were alluding to this, but one of the most unhealthy states is the only time we communicate is when there's a problem. You communicate when things are great. How's your day going? I miss you today. I love you. You mentioned some of this. You know what? I really like that dress that you had on. I really like the color of that button-up shirt. You know what? I, I appreciate you picking up the kids today. I know that puts you out a little bit. Thank you for cooking dinner. I know you had a long day, but I really appreciate you doing things. So that, that leads into that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to. I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, one other thing, I know the second bell uh, rang, um, be adaptable. person you're with, they're not going to change overnight. So why are we expecting them to have changed overnight? Be adaptable. Don't avoid the conflict. We already talked about this. Don't avoid the conflict. One of my favorite, and this is what we learned with, um, with Paul and Barnabas, you need to call a timeout. How many of you have felt in the conversation, you felt just from the pit, your, your emotions, your anger, your frustration just swelling up. Anybody ever felt that? You feel that? You need to call a timeout. Don't leave the house. Don't get into your car and don't leave the house. That is one rule. Do not leave because if you leave, it's always easier to leave a second time and a third time and a fourth time. A timeout is just exactly like it sounds. I'm going to go to my sideline you're going to go to your sideline. And if it's a 20-minute timeout, so be it. But we're coming back. Because the one thing that we don't want is this conflict to be the same five days from now. So if you need to call a time out so that you can kind of calm down, so be it. Patient. Uh, Scott mentioned this a minute ago. Long-suffering. Uh, this one is one I have to work on. Don't be passive-aggressive. Sarcastic. I, I, can, I struggle with some of this. You know, so there's some do's and some don'ts in terms of this. Additional attitudes and actions. But at its core... If we are people of the gospel, it isn't just what we believe for salvation, but we believe the gospel is the way to live in this life. Imitate God. Follow Christ. Make the first move. Be willing to sacrifice. These are some of the pillars and core principles of conflict resolution uh, in that regard. So, I know the bell rang. Appreciate you being patient. Thank you for being here.